Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Financial Securities webinar series. This is the second uh, webinar in our series, and today's topic is about atti attitudes towards savings and financial education among people with financial dis with, uh, disabilities. Uh, today's format is going to be, we're going to have a presentation from Catherine Dellum. She's from APT Associates, and she's going to share some findings uh, that she has uncovered from focus groups that were conducted last year as part of uh, the Financial Literacy Resource uh, Research Consortium. Uh, this was uh, done by both APT Associates and the Center for Financial Security. Uh, the focus groups uh, produced information about how people with disabilities and their families and their caregivers, how they address financial planning, how they understand Social Security regulations, how they address uh, employment and interact with school systems. And we're also going to hear some information about how these research is, how the results from this work uh, the, what the implications are for financial planning. So we're going to have a presentation first by uh, Catherine, and then we're going to have a discussion. Karen Harris from the Shriver Center uh, provide some, some feedback and some provocative thoughts based on that presentation. So I'll quickly just go through uh, a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we jump into the presentations. Um, all the participants on this call are muted, and that's really just to preserve the, the sound quality so we don't have a lot of background noise but we do want to encourage your participation and your questions during this presentation. And there is a little uh, bubble on the top of your screen uh, where you can click and then you can type in questions. So uh, we'll ask that even as the uh, presenters are presenting their presentations, please feel free to uh, click and, and add questions as you have them. And we will address questions at the end of the presentations. Um, I'll also just let you know that this uh, webinar is going to be rec recorded and archived, so it will be available on the Center for Financial Security's website after this call um, if you want to refer to it. Lastly, just one other little thing. If you are having any technical difficulties, there is a help desk that you can access, and there's a toll-free number. Um, so if you're having any difficulties, please call 800-442-4614. Again, that's one 800 Four four two four six one four, and uh, they can help you with any technical issues. So, without any further ado, let's just jump into the presentation. I'll give you just a little bit of background about Catherine. She is a senior associate at APT Associates. She's had uh, more than 19 years' experience working with a variety of different types of organizations, federal agencies, local governments, community organizations. Um, but all her work really is centered around um, developing and, and monitoring initiatives that help vulnerable populations achieve economic independence. She has worked on a variety of different initiatives throughout the country, including financial education initiatives, outreach services for people with disabilities, job training and employment initiatives, and community health services. And she's also previously served as a member of the Advisory Committee for Promoting Health and Social Services in Distressed Communities. So with that, Catherine, I'm going to turn it to you to hear about the focus groups that you conducted last year. Thank you, Karen, and welcome and good afternoon to everybody. Um, before we get started, I just want to note that the research that I'll be talking about today was performed pursuant to a grant from the U.S. Social Security Administration funded as part of the Financial Literacy Consortium. The opinions and conclusions expressed are solely those of the author and do not represent the opinions or policies of SSA or any agency of the federal government or of the University of Wisconsin system, including the Center for Financial Security. Moving on, um, the focus groups were held in um, August and September of 2010 with two specific population groups in Iowa, Des Moines and Mason City, and in Wisconsin in Madison and Milwaukee. And the first set of groups were with adults with disabilities receiving either SSDI or SSI who work or wanted to work. And the second group of focus groups were parents of children receiving SSI and or Medicaid assistance who were transitioning out of the school system, primarily um, young people who are 16 to 22 years old. The focus groups of people with adults with disabilities, we did four focus groups in the two states, um, 26 participants with ranging in age from 19 to 26 years old, um, 
but the majority of the people that participated were white, mixed gender, and primarily lower income, and the type of disabilities were mixed. We had um, people who had been in injured on the job, had health conditions later in life, um, and other people who had, you know, were disabled, were born with disabilities, or um, became da disabled during their childhood. The second group of focus groups that we did were of parents of children with disabilities. And again, we did four focus groups in the two states with 25 participants um, ranging in age from late 30s to early 60s. In Wisconsin, we had a mixed race group of people and in Iowa, um, the majority were white. In Wisconsin, our focus group participants were primarily female and in Iowa um, mixed gender, both male and female, and again quite a range of incomes. The core research questions that we were looking at through the focus groups, there were four of them. One, how do participants plan for their financial future? What are SSDI and SSI beneficiaries' attitudes about employment? How do parents address financial and estate planning needs for their children? And how well do participants understand SS rules and regulations? Some general findings across the eight focus groups that we did showed clearly that people were under considerable stress to address current and future financial needs. We also, um, in talking to people, understand that they need to navigate a very complex network of programs and services, both on the federal level, the state level, and the local level. Um, Throughout all of our discussions, a primary um, bottom line that people got back to um, was that whatever they did, the most critical factor was that they, wanted, they needed to maintain their medical coverage. Um, we also saw a need for accurate and up-to-date information and the important role of schools, the Centers for Independent Living, which throughout the presentations I'll be referring to as CILs, WIPAs, which are the Work Incentives Planning and Assistant uh, providers, which could either be uh, government agencies or um, local nonprofits, and again through word of mouth. And overall, what we were hearing too is that people had a very favorable experience working with SSA. While they did have some questions, they knew where to get answers. Um, they're very familiar with the Red Book. Um, you know, they just over, like I said, overall a, a very favorable um, experience working with them. The first one of the core questions that we looked at was planning for financial future. And one of the issues that we looked at is where do people get their information from? What are their sources of information? And again, we learned about the roles of the Centers for Independent Living, the WIPA providers, schools, informal networks of parents, coworkers, other family members, and the media. And I think in the media, the two big ones that we kept hearing over and over again were the Oprah Factor and also Susie Orman. Um, that people really looked to them for um, information. They also frequently looked at the um, internet but were a little skeptical about information. We also were interested in hearing about, again, how people access and validate information. And the other thing that came out of the focus groups were that even if people were getting mailings from you know, SSA or other organizations, um, that they would tend to go back to their disability navigators, their uh, benefit counselors, the CIL or WIPA staffs, um, because they just wanted someone to say, am I reading this correctly? Or I got this letter this day, I got another letter, I called, I got a different piece of information. So again, really relying on those local resources that they had built up a relationship and a trust with. And I think one of the things that came out of this that was very important that we saw was seeing how dependent people were on these sources of information and making sure that they always had the correct information too. We were very fortunate in that the people that we were working with in Iowa and Wisconsin, many of them had been in their positions for 10 or 15 years and were very knowledgeable, had very good relationships. Um, and I think we walked away from many of the focus groups saying, what would this agency do if this person left? Um, again, that people depend so, so much on them to not only get information, but to validate information that they get from other sources. And then also, too, about their interaction with SSA and learning about how they're getting information. Um, you know, whether it's letters. We also heard that they, people would like to see 
more kind of presentations from SSA in the community, in their schools, and having people come out so there would be a little more opportunity for um, give and take. One of the big issues and the most complicated issues that we also learned about were legal and estate planning services and that people, the knowledge about the different options that are available to them. And again, we would, we would um, talk to participants who felt that they were very knowledgeable, had very good resources, and then we would find out that they'd never heard of a um, you know, special needs trust. Um, the other issue that was very common to hear about, particularly since the range of areas where we did the focus groups you know, included like small towns in um, north central Iowa, you know, and then up to Milwaukee and Madison and Des Moines, was that where people were able to get legal services and where they were able to get financial services. One of the issues that we heard too was, you know, people looking at when they were doing trust or guardianships, going to their local attorney and, and you know, getting the response of, oh, sure, this shouldn't be that much different, um, and not having an attorney that was very versed in this. The other thing that we started looking at too and are very interested if people out there have any information on this is looking at where there are law school curriculums that address um, special needs trust and different types of financial and estate planning particularly for parents with, ch with children with disabilities. The other issue that we came across too was the access of these types of services, particularly in, in rural communities. Um, the people just didn't know where to go, again, unless it was a word of mouth, and it had to be someone that they were very clear, you know, that they felt very comfortable and trusting about to get this information. Um, one of the things that came up in one of our focus groups was that Special Olympics had been a great source of information for many parents because they felt that when they came together with those parents, they weren't in a hostile situation or people weren't trying to get information, but they were there as parents of children participating in an activity and they kind of felt more trusting of these parents that they had built up other relationships with. Um, in addition to getting the services available, the other thing was the cost of services. Um, you know, again, legal services, um, financial planning services. In some states, guardianship needs to be updated on an annual basis, so concerns about the cost of that. And again, the people just didn't have any other resources. Um, and then other types of services that were available. So one of the school districts that we had talked to um, worked with the benefit counselor who came in and talked to parents who then referred them on to attorneys or financial planners Again, there was a little bit of skepticism, um, you know, someone selling me a product. Um, but again, just where they're getting that, we did talk to people about if they had gone through their bar association or legal aid to help them find attorneys. And in most cases, you know, people came back and said that those services weren't available. So again, that's something that we encourage, you know, people to look at and, and help get that type of information. The other important thing was the involvement of family members, and this was on two, on a couple of different levels. Um, one of the levels was the, you know, parents' guilt, ad adults' guilt about um, the financial impacts on other family members. For example, not being able to go to Disneyland, concerned about um, college education for their other, their other children. Um, again, the financial burden of doing this, you know, again, we heard from parents um, with disabilities who were very concerned that they wouldn't be able to leave anything for their children. Um, and then another important issue that came up was educating extended family members. And again, this was primarily for children with disabilities where we heard concern about, you know, grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles wanting to set aside money in their will or give gifts um, in the name of the child with the disability and the impact that that would have on their benefits. And no matter how much the parents told them, you know, do not do this. You know, if we have a special needs trust, you can make a contribution to the special needs trust. Um, and grandparents coming back and saying, you know, I just can't leave all my money to the other children and not leave something to this, ch you know, to your child with the disability. Um, the other thing that we heard about too is parents who were saying, well, I'm going to leave all my money 
to um, you know the siblings of the child with the disabilities, and then we will expect that you know they will take care of the child you know as, as he ages, takes care of his or her needs, without clearly understanding some of the tax implications of doing so. So again, they were kind of informal commitments within the family. Um, in moving on and talking about the attitudes about employment, most of the people that were participant in the focus groups did work um, from just a couple of hours a week to you know full-time jobs where they were working up to what they saw as the income limits. They experienced a number of employment barriers. Um, you know, again, the lack of training, um, particularly for people who had become disabled as an adult and had been trained in one field and now we're looking for training in another field. Um, and then also understanding the rules and regulations. And again, this where it was a bit of a concern where people have word of mouth or someone saying, well, you can't make more than this, or you can't more, do more hours than this, and trying to find out where people were getting their information from. And again, that's where we saw that kind of having a good relationship with the WIPA provider, with the CWIC there, um, or, or with the Center for Independent Living to keep up with that information. The other thing that we heard about um, was also the role of the employers. And in the focus groups, they particularly singled out two employers, Walmart and Wells Fargo Bank, for the work that they were doing to both hire, train, and promote people with disabilities, um, and felt that their human resources staff was very, very knowledgeable, and they were very appreciative of that. For the, for the, again, the adults with the disabilities who wanted to work or, or were planning to work, what we heard again was that they, you know, have very limited income. They're concerned about living day to day. They believe that they have significant impediments to savings and financial planning, which again goes back to some misunderstanding that some people have about their assets and not being able to, um, you know, set aside any funding at all. Um, Past credit issues, and this was a very big issue because what we found for a number of people who had applied for disability benefits and then were waiting for a couple of years, that they were basically living off their credit cards. So once they did get um, on SSDI, that they had significant debts that they were paying back, um, or while they were, you know, transitioning out of their former jobs, some financial issues that they came, um, and they were just. A, uncomfortable or unwilling for a period of time to lower their standard of living. They were also concerned with how easy it was to uh, get credit. Um, and then the other issue of concern too, and again this was for adults with disability, who became disabled um, after they had a work history, was that they had, um, for those who had 401ks with their previous jobs, that almost all of them um, depleted all the funds within the 401k. Um, to help support themselves through this transition period. On a very positive note, one of the things that we found was that people with disabilities, because they are so concerned about income and where their money goes, were very detailed uh, budget keepers. They, either in their mind or on a piece of paper, knew exactly how much money they had coming in every month. They knew exactly where it was spending, you know, where they were going to spend those funds. Um, and they were very proud of that, you know. But again, their issue was that, um, you know, they needed more money. They wanted more money. Um, the other thing that we heard throughout this is that people were very concerned about not jeopardizing any benefits. Um, and again, primarily their medical coverage, but again, for many people, um, it had taken them an extended period of time to get on SSDI and were very concerned about being, um, you know, doing anything to jeopardize their eligibility. So again, they didn't always have the correct information um, and it was a real fear that they had. So again, making sure that people do have that information. As I previously mentioned too, um, and I think even more so in the group focus groups with the participants, who were adults with disabilities who worked or wanted to work was that they rely very heavily on the WIPA, WIPA, WIPA staff and also on the CS, CILs to provide and validate information about SSA rules and regulations. So again, I think the critical need to make sure that 
those people have the right information and that there is a good relationship between SSA and these type of organizations to make sure that about that flow of information. And overall, the participants who wanted to work, there were a couple of things that came across very strongly. And I don't know if this was just because you were doing this in the, in the Midwest and people have a very, very strong work ethic, but they really had a desire to be self-sufficient. Um, but they wanted to maintain their medical benefits. They, you know, in many cases people were, I, they felt guilty about having to take government um, benefits through SSDI or even SSI. Um, but they really, really wanted to be self-sufficient. But again, they had that fear that they would not be able to maintain a, a, good, a good quality of life without the uh, medical coverage provided. The other one, very concerned about lack of vocational training. And again, this came up in a number of situations where states were facing cutbacks with their vocational training programs, that there are long waiting lists, that there was an order of selection that would only serve you know, people with the most critical needs. Um, and they just felt that those services were no longer available to them. Um, other people, again, were having issues with the reduction in pay and stature. Uh, we heard from a couple of people who had been injured um, either on the job or um, in other types of accident who mentioned that it was they wanted to work, but it was very difficult to them for them to go from a professional job to a job that they felt was of lower stature. Um, you know, they, it was just a very, very difficult thing on top of everything else that they had gone through. Again, there was concern about income limits. They would like to be able to earn more money, um, but they were also understanding that it would be very difficult for Social Security to look at income limits on an individual basis, but they really wanted that option to be able to earn more, but again, maintaining their medical coverage. And another issue that came up, too, is they were very frustrated about career and salary advancement. And how this came about, um, I think particularly for people who were in sort of more professional jobs, that they had to turn down promotions at work because it would um, increase their salary and they felt that they couldn't go over that or, again, they would be jeopardizing their benefits. Um, people also mentioned working for a family-owned company where at the end of the year the owners would give, you know, five, ten thousand dollar bonuses to all of their employees and they felt that they had to turn those bonuses down, otherwise they would jeopardize their benefits. So again, they they were concerned that they had sort of hit a glass ceiling and weren't able to go any further than that. Um, for the parents of children with disabilities, one of the first things that became very apparent in the focus groups were that parents were scrambling for information about financial and estate planning, um, benefits and legal issues um, that, again, very dependent on word of mouth from other parents, um, but also to looking to their schools for additional information. What we saw, too, very limited resources in small, smaller and rural communities for parents to get this type of information. And, again, almost guilt-ridden about the impact of on their other siblings and other children, um, you know, where they were trying to address, you know, short and long-term issues. What we heard from many parents is that they don't even think about retirement. Um, I think in the two groups that we did, one in Madison and the other one in Des Moines, we did have some parents who were who worked for the state government, and they had some type of, um, you know, retirement benefits. But overall, the other people you know, really concerned that they would never be able to retire, that they needed to keep working to support their child. Um, and again, the overwhelming issue that we heard is that people didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize their um, financial benefits or create a loss of benefits. Um, some of the, the dollar amounts that we heard for medical coverage for children were just astronomical. Um, you know, children four, five, six years old, who had already had like 15, 20 surgeries, um, you know, and the concern that they had. And again, a lot of guilt on the parents on how that impacted other children. Um, I'd mentioned a little bit before about special needs trust and legal guardianships. And again, this was, you know, 
what the number one issue for parents was finding the legal and financial planning services to do you know to set up uh, this type of trust or set up a guardianship um, and again parents were looking for opportunities for general to get general information so they could consider their options and discuss it with other family members one of the other things that we heard about that was you know of a little bit of concern was how parents were looking to informal commitments among siblings about the long-term care of their brother or sister with disabilities um, you know as I mentioned before parents saying that well we're going to leave all of our money to the other children with the expectation that they will take care of their brother or sister um, and there is the concern too you know as people the siblings get married they have children of their own they may lose a job they may need move away um, how those arrangements are being held and, and, and again we also heard from a number of parents who had said you know they came into these focus groups they didn't have a will but they really want to get a will now they were very concerned after living to, with other um, you know living with some of these issues and also looking at the way that parents had talked to the other siblings about legal and financial planning issues um, some of them did so at an early age some of them said you know I just don't want to talk about it I feel too guilty to talk about it um, and again looking at some guidance on how parents can you know talk about this in a family setting and, and again as I mentioned before one of their big issues was also educating other family members and friends about financial gifts and disbursements from wills um, and how that can impact a child's benefit and you know we heard people having to be very forceful saying no don't leave my child any money um, it doesn't mean you don't love them um, but it means that you need to work with us to find out what's the best way to do this a very interesting issue that came up um, was the involvement of local school districts and how parents view the role of the school districts and we're also interested in hearing over time about how the school districts view their roles um, parents really viewed this, the school district and the special needs program as their focal point and information center many of them said that they hadn't gotten any information they had very limited information until until their children enrolled in school and they were able to talk to other parents um, staff to find out about some different options that were then open to them many parents said that until their children had enrolled in school they had been so focused on their medical conditions social conditions um, the impact on other family members that they weren't thinking you know beyond six months or a couple of years um, and again they really viewed the school districts as kind of the gatekeeper to help them go from the family into the larger community and start addressing longer term needs we also saw again across the um, spectrum of focus groups that we did and each of the four focus groups we did with parents involved multiple school districts from very large ones to small rural ones that there's, there's quite a bit of differentiation in their special needs programs the type of services that are available to parents and guardians children after school activities about bringing in speakers um, and a very very much of a concern about the limited resources that schools have you know in addition to the primary goal of educating children and again parents were very concerned about school district cutbacks state cutbacks and how these were going to impact you know the services that they were dependent on um, you know they were already seeing cutbacks in transition services in developing education plans employment plans vocational training transportation again we saw this in the large school districts where parents had depended on transportation to take their children you know to a high school that had a, a better special needs program than their local school um, but when the transportation services started going away they were no longer able to um, have their child attend a better school and again one of the things that we saw was the critical need for accurate information as soon as possible um, again looking at how parents from you know birth till the time their children enter school 
where they're getting information, if schools can start doing some outreach. Um, and again, I think it was very important in these discussions how parents viewed their school districts as this focal point and, you know, also wanting to hear from school districts to see if that's what they um, viewed their role. We did have some people who were employed by school districts in one of the um, focus groups, and, and they were saying, you know, oh, this is great, but I think if you went back to the school district, they're not going to tell you. This is what they see as their role. Um, again, in understanding the SSA regulations and policies, again, they were relying on um, CILs, WIPA staff, schools, parents, to get information and, again, validate that information. Um, the other thing we heard about rules and regulations is that people had a fear of contacting SSA because they said, it might open up my file. Even though I know I haven't done anything wrong, I'm just concerned if I call with the question and it's going to you know, involve some type of detailed response, then someone will open up my file and I might lose my benefits. So again, I think that there was a little bit of concern there. And again, you know, looking at the important need for people to get information. Um, Overall, kind of in winding up here, we had a couple of implications that I wanted to go over. Um, I think the first one is in the category of financial education and planning. And we really saw that, you know, people did have some type of financial education, but they felt that they had very limited means and weren't able to do as much as they wanted to, but they did understand budgeting, they knew about 401ks, they understood credit issues. Um, you know, it, the impact of their income and other assets on benefits was kind of one area that they did need more information on. The beneficiaries um, overall were living on very tight budgets and that most beneficiaries don't have a nest egg um, or funds for emergencies. And there were, people felt that they had no extra funds to save or build assets. They were concerned about their retirement. They were concerned about other um, children in the family that they wouldn't be able to contribute towards their college education. As far as Social Security benefits and state resources, there was some confusion about programs and resources, I think more so in larger cities where people just weren't sure who had jurisdiction over what program or where they could go to get some answers. Um, people clearly understood the report importance to remain in compliance. And I think overall, um, real strong concern about cutbacks to state-funded programs, you know, including vocational rehabilitation, um, the loss uh, in some states of disabil disability navigators, supplemental health programs, transition services, you know, the things that people had come to, re to, to rely on um, again, when we were doing this in the summer and late fall, you know, discussions were starting and legislat legislators were starting to convene, so concerns about this. Um, again, strong interest in employment and the ability to be self-sufficient. Again, as I mentioned, fear of jeopardizing benefits or even the Medicaid buy-in why people were waiting to get an SSDI. And the frustration of not being able to accept raises or bonuses or other cash incentives or, or promotions at work. Um, on the rules and regulations, again, some mixed confusion about SSA regulations and policies. And again, the heavy reliance on um, centers for independent living, WIPA providers, friends and families, and others that were brought in to validate information. And again, as I mentioned a couple times now, the critical need to ensure that parents get information as soon as possible. One of the things that we did hear, you know, from some parents is that if their children were born with some specific disabilities, if there was an advocacy group in their area, that they would come to the hospital, um, you know, as soon as the child came home, that they had services, and you know, that people were telling them about. You know, people mentioned um, the excellent advocacy work that was done by, you know, different autism groups or for children with Down syndrome. Um, but then we heard from other parents, you know, whose children had either multiple issues, um, you know, or kind of a rare disease or something, that they weren't getting the same type of information. And it wasn't until their child was getting enrolled in school and they were coming into contact with parents who did have, you know, connections to these different other advocacy groups that they were getting this information. Um, 
And again, the very interesting role of school districts with parents and how participants view their school district as a real focal point for information. The other thing that we heard too was that parents really want school districts to view them as partners, advocates, navigators, and the important role that they play in their children's education. What we also heard too was some parents had specifically moved to school districts because of their special needs programs or the district's commitment. Um, we heard of one school district in Iowa that every year when the superintendent sets his goals, that one of his top goals is always um, a commitment to quality special education services and the interaction with the families. And at the end of the year, he always reports on his progress in that area. While parents did talk about how, you know, particularly in Iowa, many of them had been able to do that, to move to a specific school district. They also felt very guilty because they knew that other lower income families did not have that option, or people who lived in rural communities whose jobs were tied to that community did not have that option of moving into a better school district. And many parents saw, thought that they would like to see either their state or the Federal Department of Education play more of a role in setting up some standards for special education programs that really looked at the interaction with the parents. Um, and again, as, I, as I've mentioned many times, you know, how parents saw the role of the, of the school district to helping them educate um, on SSA regulations, legal and financial planning, community resources, you know, how to family support programs, you know, how do you work with siblings. Um, again, it's a, it's a very important role that they see for the school districts, and we understand that not all school districts see this as their role. And again, we saw an issue of the desire to educate all school district staff about the needs of children with disabilities, not just the special um, education program staff. And again, we heard this was also a budget concern about moving forward with that. So again, it was very interesting. Um, we, we really appreciate the candor of all the people that participated in our focus groups and all the information that they shared with us. Thank you. Kathy, thank you. That was a really helpful presentation. Lots of great information. And um, we're going to hold off um, questions to your presentation until we've heard from Karen as well. But just um, one question that came up during your presentation, just for clarification. If you could remind us, Kathy, what WIPA stands for? Okay. WIPA is work planning. Oops. It's work initiatives, planning, and assistance. Great. Thank so you. they're providers that will either be, like in Iowa, they were um, part of a state agency. In some places, they're a nonprofit organization. Great. That was helpful. That was a clarification question that came through. And I just want to remind folks, um, I've gotten lots of questions about um, the PowerPoint slides and, and how to get the audio. By tomorrow morning, um, on the Center for Financial Security's website, you will be able to access these PowerPoint slides that you're seeing today. You'll be able to download, um, this, this webinar will be archived, so you'll be able to access the audio portion of today's call. And also on the Center for Financial Security's website, you can access the paper from the app for, uh, about uh, Kathy's research. So you can get all of the information. Um, some of it's actually there today. The information from the webinar will be there by tomorrow morning. And just as a reminder, the website is www.cfs. Dot WISC dot edu. Again, that's www.cfs.wisc.edu. And I'll just remind you, continue to um, send in your questions as Karen begins her presentation, and we'll get to as many questions as we can after Karen concludes her presentation. But we're happy to have her as a discussant. She's going to share her, her feedback and perspective on this research. And Karen is the supervising attorney of the Shriver Center's Community Investment, uh, in Investment Unit. And in that role, she advocates for the development of asset building programs and policies for low income and minority communities. Um, she's been in a, involved in a number of different initiatives, including the Illinois Task Force on Children's Savings Accounts. She's also been part, of, which is a statewide multi entity public and private working group. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a separate a, a initiative she was involved in, it was a statewide public entity public and private working group to improve financial education in the schools. And she's been involved in a coalition to develop alternative payday loans. Um, 
She's also written and presented on a numer- uh, numerous uh, different asset building topics. And so with that, Karen, we're going to hear from you. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thanks for staying awake uh, after lunch to listen to our presentations. We appreciate it. Uh, My name is Karen Harris, and I'm the director of what's basically the Assets Opportunity Unit at the Sargent Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, which is based in Chicago. And... Hold on one second. There we go. Um, What I wanted to do today was talk to you a little bit about who we are and what we do, as well as how we've used some of this research in our work. Um, So the Sergeant Shriver Center is a national law and policy center, and basically we identify, develop, and support um, innovative and collaborative approaches to achieve social and economic justice, especially for low-income people. Uh, My unit, the Asset Opportunity Unit, takes action against poverty for advocating for various policies that expand asset building opportunities. I also serve as uh, the co-chair of the Illinois Asset Building Group, which is a statewide coalition of various organizations, academics, financial institutions, some regulators, et cetera, all interested in how do we develop more asset building opportunities in Illinois. So when people think about poverty, uh, they mostly think about income poverty, which looks at a household's current income level. And most of the state and federal policies also focus solely on income. In September of last year, the Census Bureau released data on the national poverty rates. And the number of people in poverty in 2009 was the highest it had been in the 51 years for which estimates are available. There were 43.6 million in poverty in 2009, and our official poverty rate was 14.3%. Um, These numbers are disturbing, uh, but they're not as disturbing as when we focus on asset poverty. Now, assets are really the building blocks for financial security. Whenever I'm trying to explain to someone what I do is I explain that income support, such as public benefit programs and housing subsidies, are important to help people make ends meet now. But if you want to move people permanently out of poverty, you have to focus on assets. That's what uh, ensures that families have adequate financial reserves, they can build economic stability, and they can help themselves from falling into poverty. So basically, while income poverty focuses on whether or not a family has enough to get by, asset asset poverty focuses on whether or or not a family has enough to get ahead. And the definition that we use for asset poverty is that a household is considered asset poor if it does not have enough assets to meet its expenses for three months if all outside sources of income disappeared. So what I think you can see is that in the current recessionary times, a lot of people who thought they had the good job and the nice car and the nice house realized that they were asset poor. Um, And I think some of our discussions with various groups these days are a lot easier because people can really relate to asset poverty. So when you look at asset poverty, the data reveals several things. First is that one in five U.S. families are asset poor. In Illinois, which is where we're located, it's one in four. And in several other states, it's also along those numbers. About a third of U.S. households have zero or negative assets. And people of color um, are more likely to have asset poverty than non-minorities. So 60% of African Americans and 54% of Hispanic households uh, have asset poverty. Um, And then even more startling is that as many as 80% of households who have a person with a disability have zero assets. So when we're thinking about or trying to understand the link between disability and poverty, we have to look at employment issues. So among working age people with a disability, just under half reporting, reported being unemployed at some time in 2005, and unemployment drops as the severity of a disability increases. The chart that I have here looks at working age people with income below the poverty line, and the group is divided by disability status 
and the, and the data paints an extraordinary picture. Almost half of adults living below the poverty line have a dis disability, and people with disabilities account for a large those, larger portion of those who are experiencing income poverty than people in any single minority or ethnic group or all of the groups combined. Um, so that's really startling. And since, as I explained, asset poverty tends to be higher than income poverty, it's more likely than more than half of these people with disabilities would be asset poor. Now, a lot of people, racial groups, ethnic groups, experience uh, dis disability. Uh, but the point is, is that the disparities between those with disabilities and those without deserve the same kind of attention as other forms of inequality. So the question really becomes, how do we bring this issue um, more to the fore and also ensure that uh, disability communities' interests are part of the asset building work that we do? Well, the first thing that we did was take an, took a look at all the research, including the research done by Catherine, um, and really started to get into the data some more. Um, after we did that, we decided that uh, one of the best ways to kind of further the issue was to publish a law review article. So we published in a law review article called Access to a Accept excuse me, Accessible Assets, Bringing Together the Disability Community and the Asset Building Communities. Um, the article really just discusses the need for asset building in the disability community and various uh, ways that the two communities could work together. Um, it is available on our website, which I'll provide you with at the end. After having done the law review article, we decided that we still needed to get this research out further. So we partnered with a variety of organizations, including the National Disability Institute, the World Institute on Disability, um, Center for Economic and Policy Research, a couple of universities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and during the webinar, we used it to discuss the opportunities for increasing financial stability and independence of people with disabilities. So we really looked at what programs have, are out there, which are successful, kind of what the best practices are. And during the webinar, we've had about 240 organizations from 40 different states uh, participate. And what was really interesting to me was that over a fourth of the participants wanted information about how to connect with asset coalitions in their area so that they could start collaborations and working on these issues. From that webinar, we got a couple of different opportunities. Uh, there's a group here in Illinois called the Disabil Disability Rights Consortium, which is kind of the umbrella group for all of the um, disability advocates in Illinois. They asked us to present um, to their advocates. Um, we've also been asked from the state treasurer's office to present in connection with their small dollar loan program for people with disabilities that they've been launching. And the mayor's office on people with disabilities asked us to talk with their um, staff about the need for asset building in this area. So it really gave us a lot of opportunities to talk to a variety of groups, um, and uh, even groups that have some sway legislatively. Uh, we also found that from our, our presentations that there was need for or desire for financial planning strategies for people with disabilities. So we teamed up with the, and I'm going to forget their exact name, but it's the Illinois uh, Financial Planners Association. Uh, they do a lot of pro bono work, so we approached them and said, you know, asked if they'd be willing to partner with us. And we started doing free trainings on practical strategies for saving and increasing financial um, stability for, especially for Social Security dis disability beneficiaries. So we had one training here and another one through the uh, people's, uh, the mayor's office on people with disabilities. And so far, and this was a, a while ago, so I don't know if this is still the right number, we had about 20 organizations that were interested in doing one-on-one -on -one financial planning workshops with their clients. So basically the um, pro bono financial planners would come to the organization, let's say a Wednesday night from six to nine, and people could sign up to see them for half an hour sessions or what have you. 
from there, we realized that there was still a lot more to get out there. So <laughs> we had a second webinar uh, this past February, and it really provided some more about the strategies that are out there or developing for people with disabilities to build assets. Um, and we had this time probably 320 re registrants. Um, so the number is obviously including in increasing. And from what I understand on this webinar, we've got over 440 people that signed up. So clearly we're starting to get the message out. One of the ways that I think you can be particularly successful using um, some of this research is by developing coalitions with asset building groups. Uh, this is the um, name of a website that we created, the Asset Coalition Toolkit for States. And basically what it is, it's, it's a website for existing and emerging asset building groups to start looking at how do you uh, develop your policy agenda, how do you implement that, um, and some of the issues that you should be thinking about. So the website itself uh, has, for example, this map. Um, so you can click on your state and find out if there's an asset building organization in your state and also the contact information for that person. So if you're in Illinois, for example, you click on it and you find the Illinois Asset Building Coalition and it'll probably give my contact information. Um, but this way, disability groups can start to find the partners that they need in order to make sure that their interests are included in a broader asset building agenda. The other thing that the website has is um, various policy issues so that um, organizations can learn about the different topics that go into asset building. And one of the topics is on disability and how do you bring um, the disability community into asset building and give opportunities for them. Uh, so that's a very helpful resource. So, you know, the first way we've worked with this research is by doing uh, articles, webinars, presentations, trainings, etc. But another way that we also uh, work on these issues is through um, legislative advocacy. And there are a number of legislative issues that you could work on. Um, I'm listing some here, but then I'll talk about them all in depth in a little bit more in a minute or two. But asset limits is an obvious one. Um, IDAs, individual development accounts, and assistive technology purchases. Um, some specific legislation, um, and then leveraging uh, multi-programs, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So basically, I think you all are aware of asset limits, and those is, that is one of the most common barriers um, to savings uh, for everybody, but especially people with disabilities who have the concerns about their eligibility for SSI or SSDI. Um, you, and we all know that these asset limits are very small in the $2,000 to $3,000 range. Um, so these really need to be eliminated or changed um, if we're going to have really incentives for people to save. So last year, Congress uh, introduced legislation called the SSI Savers Act. And basically what it would have done is to raise the asset limit for SSI beneficiaries to 5000 for a person and 7500 for a couple and index these limits to inflation. Also, uh, very importantly, um, any funds in an education savings account like a 529 or a Coverdale account would not be considered an asset. Um, and any uh, savings in an IDA account would not be considered an asset. Same thing with retirement accounts, although it's kind of different for people under age 65 and over 60, uh, 65 as to the extent that they're excluded, but they would be excluded. Um, unfortunately, this bill didn't pass, and kind of given what's going on with budgets and things like that, that and wars <laughs> and everything else that's going on on the federal level, um, you know, I'm not sure what the, the status of it will be going forward. Um, I'm sure it will be re reintroduced at some point, um, just don't know when. Um, but on the meantime, you can do the same thing on the state level and work on state asset limits. Uh, several states um, have actually eliminated asset limits in some of their benefit programs, and it's worked out fine. Sometimes the states worry that you're going to have um, an influx of people joining programs once you get rid of the asset limits, but in reality, that's not the case. 
Another piece of federal legislation that um, is something that could be supported by disability groups or should be dis uh, supported are IDA reform. Um, IDAs are one of the best ways to help people save money. Um, an IDA is basically a match savings account that allows low-income families to save and build assets. Um, they are, the assets um, or the savings are used to buy a home, education, or start a small business. The majority of IDAs are funded through what's called the Assets for Independence Program, and that's a federal program that um, is administered by local nonprofits who are partnering with financial institutions. So basically, the federal government, through AFI, gives a grant to the nonprofit, and they partner with a bank or credit union or what have you. The credit union provides the matching dollars for the program. Uh, there are several problems, however, with IDAs for people with disabilities. Um, oftentimes, IDA programs have what's called an earned income requirement, so basically income from employment. So if a person only receives SSI, they couldn't save um, in an IDA because they're not going to meet this requirement. Another limitation of the AFI IDAs, that's the government-sponsored IDAs, are that assistive technology purchases are not considered a qualified purpose. Um, and as we all know, assistive technology um, can dra drastically improve someone's quality of life and also allow them other um, opportunities such as, you know, an education, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you can't purchase that with IDA funds, and um, we also know that they're very expensive purchases. So one piece of legislation was the Assets for Independence Reauthorization Act. The AFI program is funded at $25 million, and technically this funding, um, the appropriations for the funding, the legislation for the funding expired in, I think it was 2003, but it's been funded every year at the same rate anyway. So what this act would do is kind of reauthorize and make sure that we will, we will be getting it since technically it's, it's not something that is authorized. Um, it would increase it from 25 million to 75 million. Um, it would expand eligible education to include things like preparatory courses for professional licensing or education examination, room and board, um, if you're going to be uh, commuting. Um, it would also reform the adjusted gross income test so that 80% of the median area income would be eligible. The other one, the IDA Protection Act, um, would also increase the funding um, by another $250 million, so a total of $50 million. It would provide a tax credit to financial institutions that match, that provide the matching dollars, because one problem with the uh, programs are that uh, the nonprofits who receive the grant from the government often have a high, hard time finding a bank um, or credit union that's going to put up the matching dollars, um, and that's particularly true right now with the economy. Um, Unfortunately, neither of these bills passed. However, they will be reintroduced from what I understand. Um, and none of them eliminate that earned income requirement, which is a problem. But if you're doing the expanded uses, um, you could get waivers and be able to do assistive technology purchases under one of these waivers. And the final one that I want to talk about, um, which maybe some of you have heard about, is the ABLE Act. Um, ABLE Act was hopefully to overcome some of the barriers for asset accumulation for people with disabilities. Um, the purpose of the legislation was to assist families in saving. So these ABLE accounts, as they're called, um, support all kinds of quality of life measures. So independence is one of those key measures. It's not intended to replace public benefits. Um, and the general idea is that this account um, provides a tax-benefited product. What the ABLE account, or the way to understand them, I guess, is something like a cross between an IRA or a 529 and a special needs trust. Uh, in general, a special needs trust is a trust fund that's set up by an attorney for an individual with a disability um, so that they remain eligible for public benefits. Um, and also have this account, their trust account, to take care of supplementary needs. 
one of the main differences between an ABLE account and a special needs trust would be that the trustee um, can be the beneficiary. Um, so right now, beneficiaries under a special need trust, is they can't contribute their own funds to the trust. Um, so it's kind of a paternalistic system. Um, and if you if ABLE Acts were enacted, ABLE accounts were enacted, um, they'd have much more control over their um, accounts. Uh, so under the proposed legislation, you could have one account for every SSI beneficiary up to a maximum of 500000 um, It would provide that you could use the money for these variety of services that you see, um, so education, uh, tutoring, special ed, uh, employment, supports, uh, respite care, assistive technology, all the out-of-pocket medical, um, insurance, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, it did not pass. Um, and again, I think it will be reintroduced, but it's something that definitely, if um, legislators are hearing a lot from their communities, they would be more likely to pass it. And then the final thing I just want to mention is um, another program, and this is kind of where you can uh, put various different programs together. In Connecticut, they're working on a program called Connectability. Um, it's the Connect to Work Center of the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services of the Social Security Administration. Whew. Um, but what they're really doing is they're trying to work so that you can do a pass, an IDA, and Ticket to Work, and use all three of those um, in conjunction with each other. So what you would do is you have matching IDA funds and then Ticket um, to Work uh, revenues and these employment networks, um, and then the pass would be allow you to do more savings. Um, they're not really, it's not launched yet, and they're still working out some of the details, so I can't tell you much more than that. Um, but this is an example of how you can think creatively and how can you match programs and kind of pile them onto one another. And then the final thing that I just wanted to give to you are some resources you might uh, find interesting. Uh, I had mentioned our webinars. Uh, there's a link to the asset and um, accessibility webinar that we did. Um, the Asset Coalition Toolkit for States, that's the resource for your local asset coalition. Um, some of the presentations that we've given to the mayor's office, et cetera. And then some information about the Illinois Asset Building Group so you can see how coalitions um, can work together. And I think I'm done. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Karen. That was really helpful to hear um, some of the things that you've, that you've actually done, all the webinars and resources that you provided. I think they're going to be really helpful to the folks on the phone. Um, unfortunately, we are right up at, uh, at the end of our, actually we're a little bit over, um, the webinar time frame. So um, what we're going to do, we're, we're not going to be able to go into the Q&A portion, but we will have information on the website available. So again, by tomorrow morning you'll have um, the webinar slides, the paper, uh, for questions that were submitted uh, that weren't addressed, we'll be able to respond to those on the on the website as well. So I apologize in advance for having to cut this short. Um, I'll also just remind you that the next webinar is going to be Tuesday, May 10th at 2 o'clock. Uh, the topic of discussion for that webinar is about financial, uh, financial education. Is it really about uh, cog cognitive functioning? Uh, it's going to be pr the presenter is Pamela Hurd. She's going to be presenting some uh, work that she's done using the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, where she's looked at the links between early life cognition and late life financial literacy. So it should be an interesting topic uh, with uh, discussions as well. Thanks, everybody.